Chapter Twenty Four of In the Mayor's Parlor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Behind the panel. Despite the admonitions of the presiding magistrate and the stern voices of sundry officials posted here and there about the court, a hubbub of excited comment and murmur broke out on Crevin Crood's dramatic announcement. Nor was the excitement confined to the public benches and galleries. Round the solicitor's table there was a putting together of heads and an exchange of whisperings. On the bench itself, crowded to its full extent, some of the magistrates so far forgot their judicial position as to bend towards each other with muttered words and knowing looks. Suddenly, from somewhere in the background, a strident voice made its tones heard above the commotion. "'He knows! Let him tell what he knows! Let's hear all about it!' silence commanded the chairman if this goes on i shall have the court cleared any further interruption he interrupted himself glancing dubiously at krevin i think you would be well advised i want no advice retorted krevin simon had been at his elbow anxious and pleading for the last minute he it was very evident was sorely concerned by krevin's determination to speak I claim my right to have my say at this stage, and I shall have it. All this has gone on long enough, and I don't propose to have it go on any longer. I had nothing to do with the murder of Wallingford, but I know who had, and I'm not going to keep the knowledge to myself now that things have come to this pass. You'd better listen to a plain and straightforward tale, instead of to bits of story here and bits of story there." The chairman turned to those of his brother magistrates who were sitting nearest to him, and after a whispered consultation with them and with the clerk, nodded, not over graciously, at the defiant figure in the dock. "'We will hear your statement,' he said. "'You had better go into the witness-box and make it on oath.' Krevin moved across to the witness-box with alacrity, and went through the usual formalities as only a practised hand could. He smiled cynically as he folded his fingers together on the ledge of the box and faced the excited listeners. "'As there's no one to ask me any questions, at this stage anyway, I'd better tell my story in my own fashion,' he said. "'And to save time and needless explanations, let me begin by saying that, as far as it went, all the evidence your worships have heard from the police, from Louisa Speck, from Dr. Pellery, from Spizey and his wife, from everybody, I think, is substantially correct. Entirely correct, I might say, for I don't remember anything that I could contradict. The whole thing is, what does it lead up to? In the opinion of the police to identifying me with the actual murder of John Wallingford and my brother there with being accessory to the crime. The police, as usual, are absolutely and entirely at fault. I did not kill Wallingford, and accordingly my brother could not be an accessory to what I did not do, and never had the remotest intention of doing. Now you shall hear how circumstantial evidence brought to a certain point is of no value whatever if it can't be carried past that point. Hawthwaite has got his evidence to a certain point, and now he's up against a blank wall. He doesn't know what lies behind that blank wall. I do, and I'm the only person in this world who does. Now, listen to a plain, truthful, unvarnished account of the real facts. On the evening of the day before Wallingford's murder, I was in the big saloon at Bull's Snug between half-past six and seven o'clock. Mallet came in, evidently in search of somebody. It turned out that I was the person he was looking for. He came up to me and told me that his wife was away and that he was giving a little dinner party to my brother Simon and to Coppinger. They were already at his house, and he and they were anxious that I should join them. Now, I knew quite enough of my brother Simon and of Coppinger and of Mallet himself to know if they wanted my company it was with some ulterior motive and being a straightforward man, I said so there and then. Mallet admitted it. They had, he said, a matter of business to propose to me. I had no objection, and I went with him. 
What the girl, Louisa Speck, has told you about what happened after I entered the bank house is quite correct. She's a reliable and a good witness, and gave her evidence most intelligently. She took me up to Mallet's dressing room, showed me where I could get what I wanted, and left me to make my toilet. I helped myself to clean linen, and I have no doubt whatever that the handkerchief which I took from one of the drawers which the girl had opened for me was that of Dr. Wellesley's, of which we have heard so much in this case. I say, I have no doubt whatever about that. In fact, I am sure of it. Having made my toilet, I went downstairs and joined my host and his other guests. We had a glass or two of Mallet's excellent sherry, and in due course we dined, dined very well indeed. When dinner was over, Mallet got up some of his old port, and we settled down to our business talk. I very quickly discovered why I had been brought into it. What we may call the war between Wallingford as leader of the Reform Party and the town trustees as representatives of the old system had come to a definite stage, and Mallet, Coppinger, and my brother Simon realized that it was high time they opened negotiations with the enemy. They wanted, in short, to come to terms, and they were anxious that I, as a lawyer, as a man thoroughly acquainted with the affairs of the borough, and as a former official of high standing, should act as intermediary, or ambassador, or go-between, whatever you like to call it, in the matter at issue between them and Wallingford. Of course I was willing. Mallet acted as chief spokesman, in putting matters plainly before me. He said that Wallingford, since his election as mayor of Hathelsborough, had found out a lot, a great deal more than they wished him to know. He had accumulated facts, figures, statistics. He had contrived to possess himself of a vast amount of information, and he was steadily and persistently accumulating more. There was no doubt whatever, said Mallet, as to what were the intentions of Wallingford and his party. Though up to then, Wallingford's party did not know all that Wallingford knew. There was to be a clean sweep of everything that existed under the town trustee system. The town trustees themselves were to go. All pensions were to be done away with. All secret payments and transactions were to be unearthed and prohibited for the future. The entire financial business of the town was to be placed in the care of the corporation. In short, everything was to be turned upside down and the good old days to cease. That was what was to happen if Wallingford went triumphantly on his way. But it was the belief of Mallet and of Coppinger and of my brother Simon that Wallingford's way could be barred. How? Well, all three believed that Wallingford could be bought off. They believed that Wallingford had his price, that he could be got at, that he could be squared. All three of them are men who believe that every man has his price. I believe that myself, and I'm not ashamed of voicing my belief. Every man can be bought, if you can only agree on a price with him. Now, the town trustees knew that Wallingford had ambitions. They knew what some of his ambitions were, and of one in particular. They proposed to buy him in that way, and they commissioned me to see him privately, and to offer him certain terms. The terms were these. If Wallingford would drop his investigations, and remain quiet for the remaining period of his mayoralty, the town trustees would agree to the making and carrying out of certain minor reforms, which should be engineered by and credited to Wallingford, in order to save his face with his party. Moreover, they would guarantee to Wallingford a big increase in his practice as a solicitor, and they would promise him their united support when a vacancy arose in the parliamentary representation of Hathelsborough, which vacancy, they knew, would occur within the year, as the sitting member had intimated his intention of resigning. Now, this last was the big card that I was to play. We all knew that Wallingford was extremely desirous of parliamentary honours, and that he was very well aware that with the town trustees on his side, he would win handsomely whoever was brought against him. I was to play that card for all it was worth. So then, the proposal was, Wallingford was to draw off his forces, and he was to be rewarded, as I have said. Not a man of us doubted that he would be tempted by the bait, and would swallow it. 
Brent leaped to his feet and flung a scornful exclamation across the court. "'Then not a man of you knew him,' he cried. "'He'd have flung your bribe back into the dirty hands that offered it.' But Krevin Crood smiled more cynically than ever. "'That's all you know, young man,' he retorted. "'You'll know more when you're my age.' Well, he continued, turning his back on Brent and again facing the bench, that was the situation. I was to act as ambassador, and if I succeeded in my embassy, I was to be well paid for my labor. By the town trustees, inquired the chairman. By the town trustees, certainly, replied Krevin. Who else? As my principals? I think you will have to tell us what fee or payment you were to have, interrupted the chairman. If... "'Oh, as the whole thing's come to nothing, I don't mind telling that,' said Krevin. "'I shall never get it now, so why not talk of it? I was to have a thousand pounds.' "'As a reward for inducing the mayor to withhold from the public certain information which he had acquired as regards the unsatisfactory condition of the borough finances?' asked the chairman. Uh, "'Yes, if you put it that way,' assented Krevin. "'You might put it another way, as regards the mayor.' He was to just let things slide. Go on, if you please, said the chairman dryly. We understand. Well, continued Krevin cheerfully, we settled my mission over Mallet's port. The next thing was for me to carry it out. It was necessary to do this immediately. We knew that Wallingford had carried his investigations to such an advanced stage that he might make the results public at any moment. Now, I did not want anyone to know of my meeting with him. I wanted it to be absolutely secret. But I knew how to bring that about. Wallingford spent nearly every evening alone in the mayor's parlour. I knew how to reach the mayor's parlour unobserved. The secret of which Dr. Pellery has just told you was also known to me. I discovered the passage between St. Lawrence Tower and the Moot Hall many years ago and I determined to get at Wallingford by way of that passage. About seven o'clock in the evening on which Wallingford was murdered, I called at Spizey's cottage in St. Lawrence churchyard, and got the keys of the church from him, on the excuse that I wanted to copy an inscription. I locked myself into the church, and went up to the chamber in the tower. I spent some little time there, considering the details of my plan of campaign, before going along the secret passage. It would be about half-past seven, perhaps more, when I last slipped open the panel and crossed over to the moot hall. The panel at the other end of the passage, which admits to the mayor's parlour, is the fifth one on the left-hand side of that room. I undid it very cautiously and silently. There was then no one in the parlour. All was silent. I looked through the crack of the panel. There was no one in the place at all. Incidentally, I may mention that when I thus took an observation of the parlour, I noticed that on an old oak chest, standing by the wainscoting, and immediately behind the mayor's chair and desk, lay the rapier which was produced at the inquest, and with which he undoubtedly was killed. I suddenly heard the handle of the door into the corridor turn, then Wallingford's voice. I slipped the panel back till it was nearly closed, and stood with my ear against it, listening. Wallingford was not alone. He had a woman with him. And I made out, in their first exchange of words, that he had met her in the corridor just outside the door of the mayor's parlour, and that they were quarrelling and both in high temper. I— Stop! exclaimed the chairman, lifting his hand, as an excited murmur began to run round the court. Silence! If there is any interruption— now, he went on, turning to Krevin, you say you heard Mr. Wallingford come back into the mayor's parlour, and that he was accompanied by a woman with whom he was having high words. Did you see this woman? No, I saw neither her nor Wallingford. I only heard their voices. Did you recognise her voice as that of any woman you knew? I did, unmistakably. I knew quite well who she was. Who was she, then? Krevin shook his head. For the moment, wait, he replied. Let me tell my tale in my own way. To resume, I say they, she and Wallingford, were having high words. I could tell, for instance, that he was in a temper which I should call furious. 
I overheard all that was said. He was wanting to know, as they entered the room, how she had got there. She replied that she had watched Mrs. Bunning out of her house from amongst the bushes in St. Lawrence churchyard, and had then slipped in at Bunning's back door, being absolutely determined to see him. Wallingford answered that she would get no good by waylaying him. He had found her out and was done with her. She was an impostor, an adventuress. She had come to the end of her tether. She then demanded some letters, her letters. There were excited words about this from each, and it was not easy to catch all that was said. At times they were both speaking together. But she got into a clear demand at last. Was he, or was he not, going to hand those letters over? He said no, he was not. They were going to remain in his possession as a hold over her. She was a danger to the community with her plottings and underhand ways, and he intended to show certain of those letters to others. There was more excited wrangling over this. I heard Dr. Wellesley's name mentioned, then Mallet's. I also heard some reference, which I couldn't make head or tail of, to money and documents. In the midst of all this, Wallingford suddenly told her to go. He had had enough of it, and had his work to attend to. Once more she demanded the letters, he answered with a very peremptory negative. Then I heard a sound, as of his chair being pulled up to his desk, followed by a brief silence. Then all of a sudden I heard another sound, half cry, half groan, and a sort of dull thud, as if something had fallen. A moment later, as I was wondering what had happened and what to do, I heard the door which opens into the corridor close gently, and at that I pushed back the panel and looked into the mayor's parlour. It seemed to Brent that every soul in that place, from the grey-haired chairman on the bench to the stolid-faced official by the witness-box, was holding his breath, and that every eye was fastened on Crevin Crood with an irresistible fascination. There was a terrible silence in the court as Crevin paused, terminated by an involuntary sigh of relief as he made signs of speaking again. And in that instant Brent saw Mrs. Elstrick, the tall, gaunt woman of whom he had heard at least one mysterious piece of news from Hawthwaite, quietly slip out of her place near the outer door and vanish. He saw, too, that no one but himself saw her go, so absorbed were all the others in what was coming. "'When I saw what I did see,' continued Crevin, in a low, concentrated tone, "'I went in. The mayor was lying across his desk, still, quiet. I touched his shoulder and got blood on my fingers. I knew then what had happened. The woman had snatched up that rapier and run him through. I pulled out my handkerchief, the handkerchief I had taken from Mallet's drawer, wiped my hand and threw the handkerchief in the fire. Then I took up a mass of papers and a memorandum book which Wallingford had laid down and went away by the passage. And that's the plain truth. I should never have told it if I hadn't been arrested. I care nothing at all that Wallingford was killed by this woman, not I. I shouldn't have cared if she'd gone scot-free, but if it's going to be my neck or hers, well, I prefer it to be hers, and there you are. Once again, said the chairman, who was this woman? Crevin Crood might have been answering the most casual of casual questions. Who, he replied, why, Mrs. Saumarez. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of In the Mayor's Parlour by J. S. Fletcher This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Empty Room Brent was out of his seat near the door, out of the court itself, out of the moot hall, and in the marketplace before he realised what he was doing. It was a brilliant summer day, and just then the town clocks were striking the noontide. He stood for a second staring about him as if blinded and dazed by the strong sunlight. But it was not the sunlight at all that confused him, though he stood there blinking under it, and presently his brain cleared and he turned and ran swiftly down Rivergate, the narrow street that led to the low-lying outer edge of the town. Rivergate was always quiet, just then it was deserted. 
and as he came to halfway down it he saw at its foot a motor car drawn up by the curb and evidently waiting for somebody the somebody was mrs elstrick who was hastening towards it in another second she had sprung in and the car had sped away in the direction of the open country and brent let it go without another glance in its direction he turned at the foot of rivergate into farthing lane the long winding tree-bordered alley that ran beneath the edge of the town past the outer fringe of houses the alley wherein hawthwaite had witnessed the nocturnal meeting between mrs elstrick and krevin crood brent remembered that as he hastened along running between the trees on one side and the high walls of the gardens on the other but he gave no further thought to the recollection his brain was not yet fully recovered from the shock of krevin crood's last words and it was obsessed by a single idea that of gaining the garden entrance of the abbey house and confronting the woman whom Krevin had formerly denounced as the murderer of Wallingford. And, as he hurried along, he found himself saying certain words over and over again, and still again. I'm not going to see a woman hang. I'm not going to see a woman hang. I'm not going to... Behind this suddenly aroused quixotic sentiment, he was sick with horror. He knew that what Krevin Crood had told at last was true. He knew, too, that it would never have come out if Krevin himself had not been in danger. A feeling of almost physical nausea came over him as he remembered the callous, brutal cynicism of Krevin's last words. If it's going to be my neck or hers, I prefer it to be hers. A woman, yet a murderess, the murderess of his cousin, whose death he had vowed to avenge. But of course it was so. He saw many things now. The anxiety to get the letters, the dread of publicity expressed to Peppermore, the mystery spread over many things and actions, now this affair with Mallet. There was no reason to doubt Krevin Crood's accusation. The fragments of the puzzle had been pieced together. But as he ran along that lane, and as his mental faculties regained their normality, Brent himself did some piecing together. Every word of Krevin Crood's statement had bitten itself into his intelligence. Now he could reconstruct. It seemed to him that he visualized the mayor's parlor on that fateful evening, an angry, disillusioned, nerve-wracked man, sore and restive under the fancy, or rather the realization of deceit, saying bitter and contemptuous words, a desperate, defeated woman cornered like a rat, and close to her the rapier lying on the old chest where its purchaser had carelessly flung it. A maddened thing, man or woman, would snatch that up and... Blind, uncontrollable impulse, muttered Brett. She struck at him, at him, and then it was all over. Intentional? No. Yet the law. But by God, I won't have a hand in hanging a woman. Time? He knew the exact location of the door in the garden wall of the abbey house, and presently he ran up to it, panting from his swift dash along the lane. Not five minutes had elapsed then since his slip out of the excited court, but every second of the coming minutes was precious, and the door was locked. The garden wall was eight feet high, and so built that on all the expanse of his smooth surface there was no foothold, no projection for fingers to cling to. But Brett was in that frame of mind which makes light of obstacles. He drew back into the lane, ran, gathered himself for an upward spring at the coping of the wall, leapt, grasped it, struggled, drew up his weight with a mighty effort, threw a leg over, and dropped, gasping and panting, into the shaded garden. It was quiet there peaceful as a glade set deep in the heart of a silent wood. He lay for a few seconds where he had dropped. Then, with a great effort to get his breath, he rose and went quickly up the laurelled walks to the house. A moment more, and he was abreast of the kitchen and its open door, and in the presence of print-gowned, white-aproned women, who first exclaimed and then stared at the sudden sight of him. "'Mrs. Saumarez,' said Brent, frightened at the sound of his own voice in 
The cook, a fat, comfortable woman, turned on him from a clear fire. "'The mistress has not come in yet, sir,' she said. "'She went out very early this morning on her bicycle, and we haven't seen her since. I expect she'll be back for lunch.' Brent glanced at the open window of the room in which he had first encountered Mrs. Saumarez, and to which he had brought her the casket and its contents. "'Can I go in there and sit down?' he asked. "'I want to see Mrs. Saumarez.' "'Certainly, sir,' answered Cook and Parlour-maid in chorus. "'She can't be long, surely.' Brent went further along and stepped into the room. Not long, he knew very well that that room would never see its late occupant again. She was gone, of course. The room looked much the same as when he had last seen it, except that now there were great masses of summer flowers on all sides. He glanced round, and his observant eye was quick to notice a fact. Beneath the writing-table a big waste-paper basket was filled to its edges with torn-up papers. He moved nearer, speculating on what it was that had been destroyed, and suddenly, behind the basket, he noticed, flung away, crumpled on the floor, the buff envelope of a telegram. Brent, picking this up, expected to find it empty, but the message was inside. He drew out and smoothed the flimsy sheet and read its contents. They were comprised in five words. Lingmore Crossroads, 6.30. Of course, that was from Mallet. He glanced at the postmarks. The telegram had been sent from Clothford at seven o'clock the previous evening, and received at Hathelsborough before eight. It was an appointment, without doubt. Brett knew Lingmore Crossroads. He had been there on a pleasure jaunt with Queenie. It was a point on a main road whence you could go north or south, east or west, with great facility and doubtless Mrs. Saumarez, arriving there early in the morning, would find Mallet and a swift motor awaiting her. Well? A sudden ringing at the front door-bell, a sudden loud knocking on the same door, made Brent crush envelope and telegram in his hand, and thrust the crumpled ball of paper into his pocket. A second later he heard voices at the door, heavy steps in the hall, Hawthwaite's voice. No, said the parlour-maid, evidently answering some question, but Mr. Brent's in the study. The mistress, Hawthwaite, with one of his plain-clothes men, came striding in, saw Brent, and closed the door, shutting out the parlour-maid. Gone? he asked sharply. They say, out for a bicycle ride, answered Brent, purposely affecting unconcern. Went out very early this morning. "'What did you come here for?' demanded Hawthwaite. "'To ask her personally if what Creven Crood said is true,' replied Brent. Hawthwaite laughed. "'Do you think she'd have admitted it, Mr. Brent?' he said. "'I don't.' "'I think she would,' answered Brent. "'But—' "'Well?' inquired Hawthwaite. "'I don't suppose I shall ever have the chance of putting such a question to her,' added Brent. "'She's off.' Hawthwaite looked round. Hmm, he remarked. Well, it only means another hue and cry. She and Mallet, of course. There's one thing in our favour. She doesn't know that Creven Crewe knew anything about it. Are you sure of that? suggested Brent. Oh, sure enough, affirmed Hawthwaite. She hasn't an idea that anybody knows. So we shall get her. What about Creven Crude and Simon? asked Brent. "'Adjourned,' replied Hawthwaite. "'There's no doubt Crevin's told the true story at last, "'but he and Simon are still in custody "'and will be until perhaps tomorrow. "'We want to know a bit more yet. "'But I'll tell you what, Mr. Brent, "'this morning's work has broken up the old system. "'The town trustees and the ancient regime, as they call it, gone. "'Smashed, Mr. Brent.' "'What are you going to do about this?' interrupted Brent, glancing round the room. "'Set the wires to work,' answered Hawthwaite, half carelessly. "'Unless she and Mallet have laid their plans with extraordinary cleverness, they can't get out of the country. A noticeable pair, too. Went out very early this morning cycling, did she? I must have a talk to the servants. And that companion now, Mrs. Elstrick, where's she got to? I noticed her in court.' 
"'Left, sir, just before Krevin Crood finished,' said Hawthwaite's companion. "'I saw her slip out.' "'I well observed Hawthwaite. "'I don't know that that matters. "'If any of them could get through the meshes of our net. "'Mr. Brent.' "'Well?' asked Brent. "'We've got at the truth at last about your cousin,' continued Hawthwaite, "'with a significant look. "'It's been a case of one thing leading to another.' and two things running side by side. If we hadn't cornered Krevin Crood, we'd never have had his revelations about the town trustees. Talk about your local government board inquiry. Why, five minutes of Krevin's tongue work did more than half a dozen inquiries. I tell you, sir, the old system's dead. The Crood gang was smashed to pieces in that court this morning. Somehow, it's that that interests me most, Mr. Brent. But business... He turned to the plainclothes man and nodded towards the door. "'Fetch those servants in here,' he said. "'They've got to know.' Brent went away again, carrying certain secrets with him. He put them away in a mental vault and sealed them down. Let Hawthwaite do his own work. He would give him no help. He foresaw his own future work. Wallingford, dead though he was, had won his victory, and in his death had slain the old wicked system. Now there was building and reconstruction to be done, and it was his job to do it. He saw far ahead as he trod the sunlit streets of the old town. He would marry Queenie, and they would settle into the slow-moving life of Hathelsborough, and he and the men who thought with him would slowly build up a new and healthy state of things on the ruins of the old. So thinking, he turned mechanically towards Mrs. Appleyard's house, in search of Queenie. Queenie, said Mrs. Appleyard, was in the garden behind. Brent went through the house and out into the garden shade. There he found Queenie. She sat in a summer house, and she was shelling peas for dinner. The End End of Chapter 25 Recording by Nicholas Clifford, Middlebury, Vermont, USA. End of the Mayor's Parlor by J. S. Fletcher.